So today we have Olivia Munzer here. Uh, her presentation is on a long-term study on wildlife community response to compensatory stream and wetland mitigation. Uh, and with that, Olivia, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, great. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, this is a multi-taxa wildlife survey at um, NC Division of Mitigation Services, um, this, their stinking quarter stream and wetland mitigation site. I have a lot to go through, so um, let's get started. I might talk a little fast. My apologies. Okay, before I just before I discuss the project, I wanted to lay the foundation for why we are conducting the study. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Clean Water Act and compensatory mitigation. So compensatory mitigation is complex, and so I'm just going to basically provide basic background information as to how it applies to the study. And the objective of the, of the Clean Water Act is to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of waters of the United States. It prohibits the discharge of dredge and fill materials in waters of the U.S., Section 404 of the Clean Water Act authorizes discharge or fill with a permit. A permit from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, or also referred to as the Corps, is required prior to impacting the function and quality of aquatic resources as required by the Clean Water Act. An applicant must first explore all practical means to avoid impacts, and if they cannot, then they must try and minimize impacts. And if the applicant has explored all practical alternatives for avoiding and minimizing impacts, projects impacts and a project impacts exceeds an applicable permit threshold, then the compensatory mitigation is required. Mechanisms for providing comp compensatory mitigation is by providing fees to a mitigation bank or in lieu fees program, such as the NC Division of Mitigation Services Bank, or an applicant can do a permittee responsible mitigation, which is less common. So compensatory mitigation is defined as the restoration, establishment, enhancement, or preservation of aquatic resources for the purpose of offsetting losses of aquatic resources resulting from activities authorized by the Corps of Engineers permit. Except for preservation, mitigation occurs on wetlands and streams that are typically highly manipulated and degraded by agricultural activities, livestock, or urban development. There are four main types of stream and wetland mitigation, depending on how degraded or manipulated the aquatic resources are. So there's rest restoration, establishment or creation, enhancement and preservation are the four main types. Except for preservation, mitigation involves the manipulating the physical, chemical and biological characteristics of a site to achieve a goal. So establishment alters the upland site to develop an aquatic resource. And again, this, is, this isn't conducted very often. It's more conducted with wetland mitigation. You have restoration, which returns the natural and historic functions to a former or degraded aquatic environment, such as taking a stream outside of its banks and creating a new stream and filling the old stream bank. Um, in under restoration, you have reestablishment, which is rebuilding a former wetland and results in the gain in aquatic resource function and area. And for wetland, you also have the type of restoration, which is rehabilitation, which aims to gain wetland function, such as hydrology, for example, um, and plants. But unlike reestablishment, it does not gain an aquatic resource area. Enhancement is defined as improves the functioning of an existing aquatic resource. And preservation is protects and maintains an exi existing aquatic resource through the real estate protections or other conservation actions. Preservation is usually a site that is not very heavily degraded or impacted. So this is the basic overview of the mitigation process. The permittee impacts an aquatic resource in a service area such as a watershed, and they must pay the fees to a mitigation banker. A mitigation banker, or also referred to as a provider or sponsor, is a private or public entity responsible for establishing um, the mitigation bank and operating it. They buy the site for the mitigation project. Um, and they do all the work. They work with the interagency review team, or also known as the IRT, um, to approve the mitigation, the plans for building the mitigation site, maintaining it, and monitoring the site. And then eventually, whether 
The IRT, IRT provides um, the IRT provides regulatory review, approval, and oversight of the bank. WRC is part of the IRT group here in North Carolina. The success of the project is documented through the use of performance standards evaluated through monitoring over seven years post construction. These performance standards are defined as observable or measurable physical, including hydrological, chemical, or biological attributes that are used to determine if the project meets their objective as stated in the mitigation plan. So the mitigation plan is the basis for what's gonna happen and how the success of the mitigation ends up being. In general, the site is placed into a conservation easement in perpetuity, in perpetuity if the mitigation site is deemed successful by the IRT after seven years of monitoring. So the stream function pyramid um, was developed by Harman et al. in 2012 and inspired by Fischens Fischen, 20, 2006 serves as a useful concept for understanding um, streams and their ecological function and the potential to provide functional uplift for mitigation. And although this framework was developed for streams, it can also be applied to a degree to wetlands. Um, also, it can be determined if a, this framework can help determine if a mitigation project is successful by evaluating performance standards that are based on these five major functions. So you're looking at hydrology, which, the, which is the base of the pyramid, and is how water is transported from the watershed to the channel. Hydraulics is the transport of water in the system, such as in the floodplain and throughout the channel. And geomorphology is the transport port of wood and sediment to create diverse bed form. Physiochemical is the temperature and oxygen regulation, organic matter and nutrients in the system. And biology is the biodiversity of aquatic and riparian life. So methods that are typically used to achieve functional uplift um, for stream and um, stream and wetland mitigation include for stream specifically constructing a channel in the historic floodplain, elevation to improve channel, dimension, pattern, and profile, which is done in restoration. As I mentioned earlier when I discussed restoration, sometimes they'll build a whole new stream segment and then fill in the old stream segment with, with fill. And so it's basically starting from new. Um, then providers will install in-stream structures to improve habitat and grade control, um, and that will occur for both restoration and enhancement styles of stream mitigation. Um, they will stabilize stream banks and pull back banks um, in, in, in sections of eroded stream that only require an enhancement of the stream. Um, that way, the floodwaters have access to the floodplain during high flows. And then providers will also reduce in for wetlands, for example, reduce compacted soils and wetlands. Um, if there's impoundments, providers will will um, drain the impoundment and return it to a function as a stream again. And usually there's wetlands um, associated with that action. Um, they will fence out cattle and put up permanent fences, plant native vegetation in wetlands and riparian areas, and they also treat invasives. So those are some of the basic construction activities they do for functional uplift. Over the seven year monitoring period, the providers Providers will measure stream channel stability and stream hydrology, monitor woody and vegetation growth, and remove invasive species, to name a few of the things they monitor. They for so now if we go back to this stream functions pyramid framework, the biology functional par par uh, parameters are benthic macroinvertebrates, fish communities, and macrophyte communities, and landscape connectivity. Except for measuring woody vegetation growth, um, the physiochemical and biology performance standards are not typically monitored for mitigation. The North Carolina Mitigation Guidance documents this, that water quality and macroinvertebrate monitoring is optional and it isn't conducted very often. Um, the reason is stated that macroinvertebrate and water quality functions may not show measurable improvements with the seven year monitoring period, and that's why it's optional. Mitigation projects that provide landscape connectivity, however, are often preferred by the um, IRT. So now we're going to move on from functional uplift to ecological uplift. And this is ecological uplift is, is a term that is stated in the mitigation plans. 
and it is said to be an indirect benefit of mitigation, but it is typically not measured with the exception of woody vegetation establishment. In general, impacts to fish and wildlife are usually not considered unless those species are federally, federally protected under the Endangered Species Act. However, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers states that citing a compensatory mitigation should take a watershed approach to support sustainability or improvement of aquatic resources in a watershed. And the Corps states also that it's important um, considerations and information that should be used in a watershed approach is the presence and habitat requirements of sensitive species. The Environmental Law Institute also states that watershed approach provides an opportunity for various programs such as the State Wildlife Action Plan to guide compensatory mitigation, mitigation decision making. Um, and wetland restoration projects under the National Resource Conservation Services Wetland Reserve Program have contributed to the recovery of species of greatest conservation need prioritized in the State Wildlife Action Plan. Similarly, it seems that compensate, compensatory mitigation under the Clean Water Act could provide wildlife habitat for SGCN species as well as other rare species. So this all leads to kind of the objectives of our study. Our, our objectives are to determine, first of all, if mitigation does provide quote unquote ecological uplift as, as the providers say it will. Does mitigation provide ecological uplift not only in the aquatic system, but also in the terrestrial community? And if so, how long does that uplift take? Secondly, we will investigate the response of wildlife communities to compensatory stream and wetland mitigation. Our objective is to determine whether community composition patterns differ, not only over time from before construction to post construction, and within those seven years of post-construction monitoring, but also among various mitigation types. So enhancement and restoration and preservation. This includes species of greatest conservation need and rare species. Um, the, revolts, the results of this study will guide recommendations for improving mitigating practice, mitigation practices. So they benefit wildlife communities, including these SGCN and rare species. And we will establish protocols for future studies, such as fieldwork, data management, data analysis, and data interpretation. Our objective is to survey other such mitigation sites, um, probably not as big as this one, but other mitigation sites, since they can vary in their impacts and degradation from site to site. So this project was developed after I had been attending some mitigation site visits as part of the IRT. I had been asking these questions and I approached some of um, my collaborators on other projects. And basically this study would not be what it is without our partners that um, are that are helping WRC with this project. Not only have staff from WRC Fish and Habitat Divisions assisted with the surveys, but also from our partners and other entities. Um, the collaboration with Lindsay Zarecki and her team from Greensboro Science Center and Dr. Rada Petrick from the UNC system is integral to the study, and we couldn't have had better partners. Um, Restoration Sister Systems, which is the provider for this mitigation site, and the NCDMS have provided equipment, funding, survey data, access, and field support. And so collaboration with these different entities have been integral to the size, not only with the size of this project, but with hopefully the outcomes of it. So the Stinking Quarter Project, Stinking Quarter Wildlife Mitigation Project is located in southeastern Guilford County. This project is, an, as I said, an NCDMS mitigation bank and restoration systems is the provider and Axiom is their subcontractor who conducts a lot of the surveys and um, construction. The entire site is 116 acres within the Cape Fear O2 River Basin. If you notice the site, um, this is the area that we're conducting our survey right here. Surround, it's in the, um, the boundary conservation easement is surrounded by um, the red, and then this is the extra segments that aren't as integral into our study. So it's one of the larger sites in North Carolina. Um, it occurs along the North Prong Stinking Quarter, which is the main tributary that flows through the projects, and its watershed is approximately 3.05 square miles. 
So as I said, our research is being, being conducted in an easement east of Highway 62. Here's 62. Um, this is where our different, we have five sites located throughout the 68 acres. Um, four of the sites are within the hay pasture. So D, A, B, C, and D are surrounded by hay pasture. And E is a um, cow is used as a cow pasture for most of the year. This project has all types of the stream and wetland mitigation, and that is one of the reasons we picked this project. Um, now you'll notice that um, blue, the shades of blue are restoration. The shades of yellow orange are enhancement and green is preservation. These colors will be used in the results section for e easy reference as to the type of mitigation. Just to kind of give you an idea of what these sites look like, Site A is an unnamed tributary to the North Prong Stinking Quarter, has a buffer of approximately 25 to 50 feet of riparian um, forested area. The riparian area has young trees with some young snags. Wetlands lie on the south side of the creek. Um, here is a wetland. Um, this gets mowed once to twice per year because most of it is actually full of fescue. And even though it has fescue scattered throughout it, there's a moderate diversity in wetland flowering herbaceous species. This is another wetland that um, for the most part gets untouched. It's between these two um, lines of trees and then the streams over here. This is what the stream corridor looks like. It gets a lot of, as you can see, a lot of sediment. There is a lot more erosion downstream. This is on the upper end of site A. This is an aerial view of all the different survey locations. So we have our mammal traps that are located here. Our cover boards um, are 50 meters apart. Um, we've got our leaf litter bags, our bee bowl stands, and our butterfly transects and so forth. Site um, B is this is a rest is the restoration part. This thin riparian habitat has young trees. The west side is bordered by a hay pasture, um, which you can kind of see right here. And the east side has a degraded wetland with sparse tree cover. Adjacent to the wetland is more mature stand of trees. The degraded wetland is mowed one to two times per year. And at this site, there's a farm pond that um, that will be breached um, for con during construction and turned back into a stream. The picture was taken right here on a cool day, so it actually looks decent, but usually um, it's not that pleasant. Um, the, there is a farm pond that lies just upstream, upstream of the reach and it is what impounds stinking quarter. So where's my, okay. So here is stinking quarter, North Prong stinking quarter. Here's that upstream impounded portion of stinking quarter. And this is our study site. This is the other pond that will be breached during construction. And this is um, one of our uh, bad acoustic sites just for reference down the line. And this is another bad acoustic site, um, but you'll see this is hay pasture and hay pasture. Right here is that degraded wetland. It's kind of hard to see with all the tree cover, but it's, um, it's there. So site C is our private preservation site. It's mature forests with some invasive species. Flowering species occur mostly within the canopy gaps and along the stream corridor. The stream has some erosion, but it's mostly moderate, has moderate pattern profile and dimension. This year, an abundance of sediment has also been entered the stream. Um, I'm unsure as to why, maybe just heavy flows. And a beaver dam recently got built on the upstream portion of the preservation section. You can see here's the river corridor. It doesn't look as nice during winter. Um, here's a view of some of the inside interior of the preservation site. This is an over aerial overview of what the preservation site is. So you can see um, the stream here and then what our site looks like. It's a decent um, bit of woodland habitat that's um, not too bad. Um, here's our acoustic site bat acoustic monitoring equipment. And here's just a little bit of agriculture. On to the site D, it's restoration. This is a thin riparian habitat with mostly dense herbs and shrubs. The buffer is approximately 10 feet on average or less. The creek is heavily incised. Um, it is surrounded by active hay fields. 
this one pot, there is one pocket of mature trees, which are mostly tree of heaven, which is invasive, and a farm pond, which is the stream's been impounded. The fescue surrounds the entire site. So if you can see, this is the stream right here, the stream corridor where a lot of our equipment and surveys were completed. This is the one impounded um, stream. And then here's just an upstream. This is another portion of the, um, the future restoration site. This is an aerial view. You can see how thin the riparian corridor is. Here's that one impounded site where we had did some dip netting and minnow traps. And then the one stand of trees is right about here. I also want to point out we have two other two acoustic sites here for bats. Um, one is over here. The easement changed a little bit, so it's outside of the easement, um, but it's right next to another impoundment. And then here on the edge of this forest facing this hay pasture. Um, our last site is Site E. It's an enhancement. It's the downstream portion of Stinking Quarter of the project site. Um, there is one portion right here that is will be um, enhanced or restored into um, a nice wetland. It does still get wet, but it's highly degraded by cows. This whole site has cows grazing on it for most of the year. Um, it is a small number of cows. It's probably like 15 or 20 cows, so it's not a big herd. Um, but you'll see here, this is the debt way downstream portion of it. Um, and this is a large wetland complex that runs through this hardwood um, bottom one forest. And this yellow is mostly clover. Clover and buttercup. This is an overview. You can see that this is the end of the easement. This is the stinking quarters running through here. Um, and this is our mammal traps and our various different surveys survey locations for our various different taxa. OK, now to talk a little bit about our methods. Right now we're doing pre-construction surveys. We've been doing them for about two years. The expected construction of this mitigation site will begin in this upcoming winter in 2023. It's a really big site, so it's going to take an unusually long time. Um, however, after it's constructed, we'll continue monitoring up to seven years. The types of surveys we're conducting for terrestrial surveys is mammals, birds, reptiles, bees, and butterflies. And aquatic surveys we're conducting fish, amphibians, crayfish, mussels, and micro, uh, macro invertebrates, which is not a specifically but DMS. And then we also are doing water quality. So to talk about mammal surveys, we have seven wildlife acoustic SM4 bat ultrasonic recorders located at each site with the two extra detectors I pointed out at ponds that would be restored back into streams. The bat detectors record year round. Kaleidoscope is a software used to auto identify bat calls. However, many calls, especially those recorded as myotis species will be verified by a bat biologist. We have six Bushnell tra trail cameras recording year round. Um, there's one at every site with an extra one at the preservation site. Um, just since it's the only preservation site we have, we add an extra camera. Um, we conducted small mammal trapping at five at the five different sites. Each transect had 40 um, live traps. We had 10 Longworth traps and 30 Sherman live traps. We would conduct surveys once per month for two nights per month. Um, each rodent that we captured received an ear tag for mark and recapture study. For birds, we have six wildlife acoustic SM4 audio recorders, and actually this good, it also records our frog calls as well. It records every five minutes um, per hour from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. and from 6 p.m. to 12 a.m. Um, to be able to get owls and um, frogs. We are using the Kaleidoscope sound analysis software, um, but it's still a lot of manual listening. Um, we are currently still going through the call database um, or the calls to analyze them. Um, the analyze, we will analyze the bird calls during breeding bird season and winter. And for frogs, we're looking at winter, spring, and summer. For leaf litter bag, for herptofauna, we're doing cover, bur cover boards, leaf litter bags, again, the acoustic recording, minnow traps, and dip netting. Leaf litter bags are conducted in spring and summer. We put 10 
um, leaf litter bags at each transect um, about five meters distance apart. We have, um, and then we also have cover boards. We check them once per month and they're out all year. We check them all year. We have, um, they're a mix between roof tin and plywood. And at each site, we have five cover boards, except at preservation where we have eight cover boards. We conducted minnow trapping in those two ponds that I pointed out, and we did dip netting, which was also conducted in spring and summer. For bees, we set up, I don't know if you've ever listened to Gabriella Garrison's bee talk, but this is based upon her um, game land bird protocol, or bee per protocol, excuse me. For bees, we set up four transects at site A, B, C, and E. We didn't do D because due to time restrictions of getting all the surveys completed in one day and the pasture management that was occurring. Um, once per month, we would set out three transects of 10 colored bowls spaced five meters apart first thing in the morning, and then we'd collect the samples about nine, eight or eight hours later, nine to 10 hours later. The bowls had soapy water to make sure that the bees don't escape. Um, we conducted act, act, um, active netting of bees from 10 to 1 and 1 to 4 at each site for 30 minutes each. And bee surveys occurred from April through October. Um, up here, you'll see a diagram of how the bee bowls were set out to just get an idea of how, how that occurs. Um, and then butterfly surveys were conducted based on the Pollock walking transects transects. We walked 150 meter transects and counted and identified all butterflies that could be identified um, leap to species. And then we just wrote down the genus or family. All flowering species were recorded as well. So we know what's blooming at the time of bees and butterflies. Also, we noted butterfly species during bee surveys as well, just to see what's out there as incidental observations. Um, for Muscles, we did time tactile visual searches with uh, Brina Jones. And uh, we, during 2000, and we did it at all five sites. However, site A was only sampled once um, and not, not in 2001. In 2002, we decided we'd try and mark all the muscles that we captured with that pink um, beautiful nail polish. And hopefully um, when we go back out to conduct Post-construction surveys, hopefully we'll find some of our specimens. For fish, we did timed electrofishing at all five sites in 2001 and 2002. So for both pre-construction um, years. For crayfish, we did kick staining. Um, we haven't done the second year of kick staining. Um, we did dip, we'd catch, capture crayfish in our dip net surveys, leaf litter packs, and minnow traps as well. So macroinvertebrates was actually contracted out from DMS to Eaton Scientific. He did benthic sampling. Uh, we also have a UNCG graduate student who plans on conducting um, macro benthic invert um, sampling at five at the five sites as well as another study I will explain at the end of this. Um, DMS, uh, Greensboro Science Center, excuse me, did also water quality at each site um, each month. They used a hex spectro photometer and they tested for dissolved oxygen, conductivity, pH, nitrates, nitrites, ammonia, total chlorine, phosphate, and water hardness. This is provided by um, Greg Melia at the DEQ. They decided to um, conduct water quality stations at the headwater portions of Stinking Quarter site. Um, and that was basically to reduce noise from the outside of the watershed. This allows research to better pinpoint the changes and more direct attribute, attribute them to restoration efforts. Staff is monitoring using ISCO devices and pulled samples daily week, data weekly. Staff be, will be able to compare pre and post nutrient changes from restoration. Um, this data will help state and researchers model how nutrient removal works for restoration and determine which sites have higher levels of potential nutrient removal as restoration candidates. They're coupling this data with species and micro macro invertebrate data, and we'll be able to hopefully provide a larger picture of how restoration impacts the whole system. These are their, their sites. Um, our study sites are down here. This is site A. So theirs is in the upper portion of Stinking Quarter Mitigation Project site. 
Um, so they've got um, three at really at the headwaters and then a couple downstream. This is an ex shows you an example of not only the landscape, but also their, their equipment. Um, Larry Eaton also conducted one sampling period for pre-construction surveys for macrobenthix. He collected two upstream of our site A, um, which are up here, one and two. And then he conducted, um, then, then he has one downstream of our site A, one in our site B, and then he has one downstream of our preservation site and one downstream right at the very end of our project. And the sites didn't quite correspond to our study sites. So now to get to some results. Um, now, just so you know, these are preliminary results for most of the taxa and the water quality surveys. And um, we have a, a lot of data that we're still going through. So these um, might not be the highest statistics you've ever seen. Um, but uh, for the most part, for mammals, we found 11 species of small mammals identified at stinking quarter. Three of those species um, were invasive. So we had black rat, Norwegian rat, or Norway rat, and um, house mouse. Um, the highest diversity was seen at site D, or species, sorry, highest species richness was at site D and site A. Both are thin riparian habitats surrounded by pasture. We were actually quite surprised that Site D had so much diversity. Um, if you look at the number of catchers, interestingly, um, Site E was very low for both species richness and capture rates, um, but Site C had a high number of captures, but low, lower species diversity. Now, if you look at, at more relative abundance of small mammals, Site A, A and D had the highest relative abundance of an um, of, oops, sorry, if you look at um, that highest relative abundance of invasive species, although the black rat was not captured at site E. So here's black rat. Um, here you have Norway rat, which was only captured at site A. And then um, house mouse over here, which was mostly captured at site D but also observed at site A. Now, again, if you remember these colors, the, the orange and the yellows are more of an enhancement, the blues are restoration and the green is preservation. Um, the cow pasture only had white-footed mouse, um, which is site E, and here you can see it's really high. Um, white-footed mouse was the most prevalent species overall, but also it was the only species we captured at site E. Um, and site E, actually, we had a lot of raccoon disturbance um, of our traps. So next year, we're, next time, we're going to try and use a have a heart to try and capture those overnight and then release them the next day so they don't take apart our traps. Um, Eastern harvest mouse, mouse um, is actually captured. There's Eastern here. It's only captured at site D, which is really interesting. A site D is, is a very interesting site. So looking at bats, um, we got all the bats that we expected to occur in the Piedmont. The species were red bat, big brown bat, hoary bat, and here I'll point to the hoary bat, silver haired bat, skipping these myotas, evening bat, tricolor bat, and Brazilian free tailed bats. Um, so all those seven species were recorded, recorded at each site, including tricolor bat, which is a SGCN species and a federal proposed endangered species due to white nose syndrome. I do want to notice that myotis was said to be detected. Here's a here's three myotis species. Um, one um, caution is that, as I mentioned before, some of the calls um, of myota species can have similar call structure to each other and also to red bat. So often the auto classifier does not identify the correct species. So the likelihood we have gray bat, which is a mostly has only been found in the mountains, is um, not likely. Um, this is southeastern bat that could potentially occur out there. And little brown bat is now um, very rare due to white nose syndrome. We've only caught one. Um, little brown bat in the Piedmont in 2016. However, that doesn't mean it doesn't occur. We just haven't caught it yet. So hopefully in hopes 
that there are myotas out there. We we may do some spring mist netting to see if we can capture those and also any tricolored bats since they are federally proposed and endangered. Now, if you notice red bats and big brown bats are the most common species at the site. Um, these are the total number of passes detected um, by the acoustic um, equipment. Now, this is um, is a lot of information. This is the number, this is each site, A, B, B2 is the pond, C, D1, D2 is another pond, and then E. Um, interestingly, um, site A and C have an inverse relationship between red bat, red bat and big brown bats. So here at site A, you have more um, big brown bats and lesser um, red bats, whereas at site C is the inverse. You see a higher number of red bats. Um, site A is again more open pasture with thin riparian area, whereas um, and big brown bats roost in a variety of different habitats, including snags, whereas um, site C is surrounded by mature forest with just a little bit of agriculture, but um, red bats roost in the leaves of, you know, of larger trees or trees. So that might explain as to why that's occurring. One interesting note is that at the pond at B2, um, you had a lot of silver hair bat calls, which is really interesting, right? So our game cameras, we have 11, we captured 11 mammals on the cameras, including bats and bobcats. Um, bats were mostly captured on the camera at site B and E. Um, bobcat was detected at site C. Um, which is the preservation site. And not surprisingly, deer was the most common species. Here's the picture of the bobcat, and then you just have your coyote at site A. So um, this is just looking at the number of individuals we captured, photos we captured. You can see site B had the highest number of um, photos, and site D had, site D and A really had low numbers. So quickly looking at herptofauna, this is a graph of the species richness. The number of amphibians are on the bottom of species and the number of species that we observed were on the top. Now this isn't just um, cover boards, this also includes incidental observations. We noticed that we were capturing almost more incidental observations of reptiles than we were of actually under the cover boards. Um, so we may consider other uh, methods in the next study that we do. However, you will see that um, reptiles were pretty high at site B, um, which is a restoration site, but it has a wetland complex and riparian area that's adjacent to actually a wooded, wooded, a decent sized wooded um, lot. And then site C was preservation, so um, we had a lot of amphibians noted there. Um, just so you know, for SGCN species, we did find two eastern box turtles. And again, we're still analyzing amphibian calls from the acoustic recorders. So on to fish. Um, we had a total of 17 species of fish, which um, Brina Jones tells me is overall, the number of fish species is pretty low. Um, so you see all the different species that we, uh, we captured here over the two sampling periods. Um, site C actually had the highest diversity of fish, which is preservation site, which is great news. Um, but overall, these species were made up of um, tolerant general species, and these are they are the types of community fish communities that we'd see in heavily impacted and graded systems. Um, we did have two non-native species, the green sunfish, which is not native to North Carolina, and the crescent shiner, shiner which isn't native to the Cape Fear River Basin. Um, the sites were overall dominated by mosquito fish, bluegill, and cheek, creek chub. Um, and with mussels, we had um, eastern liptio, as you see in this graph, was the most common um, mussel species, and it was observed at all sites. Um, Eastern creek shell was found at, is the species of greatest conservation need, was surprisingly found at site E, which is where the cattle pasture is. 
um, and it has a high number of um, high amount of sedimentation that we actually thought we wouldn't get any mussels, um, but we actually got a large amount of mussels there and to and over the course of the surveys for Eastern Creek shells. Other species detected was the Atlantic spike and the paper pond shell. So those levels were pretty low. Um, Atlantic spike and Eastern Creek shell and Eastern Liptio, um, those three species were found at site E. Um, this is just a, because we caught so many number of um, mussels at site E, I kind of wanted to show you this, um, the number of mussels per person hour. Um, site A, again, we only conducted one sampling period during 2002, and we only captured um, one mussel during that whole time. Um, but if you see site E, on average, we had about 54 or so mussels per person hour, which is incredible. Um, and then followed by site C. Now site um, B and A are pretty small streams comparatively to site E and C, um, so that is something to keep in mind. So results of butterflies, this is again a very basic analysis of butterfly data. The, the bars depict butterfly species richness and the line flowering plant species richness. You can see the relationship between um, between the flowering plants and butterflies at site B had the highest species richness of plants and butterflies, of flowering plants and butterflies, um, although site D had low species richness for flowering plants. plants um, the shrubs, they were really dense in that creek, even though there's not much of a riparian area in that. Um, it, was, it is well known that pollinators require adequate amounts of foraging and nesting resources, so it's not very surprising um, that there's a, core, you know, there's a relationship there, um, and that creating high-quality habitats with diverse host plants and microhabitats is really important for their conservation. We did find monarch butterflies and milkweed at Stinking Quarter, specifically site um, B, and um, which was very diverse, as you can see here in the number of flowering plants. Um, and monarch is listed as a federal candidate species in SGCN species. Now quickly, we have not um, really analyzed our bird calls yet, but just to note, we have detected, we detected a barn owl, Kentucky warbler, and bobwhite as SGCN species. Those were at, um, at or site A and B. Bees, um, we are just now begin pinning the, the netted bees and we, not, we have not identified most of them. We have yet to pin and identify the bees from the bowls. However, while I was out in the field, you can um, easily identify the American bumblebee, which is an SGC and species, which we identified while netting. We also found a le lemon cuckoo bee, which was noticed when netting. It was very different and so we captured it and we brought it to Elsie Young staff for MC State and she identified it. This is a rare species. And it was, even though Site C doesn't have that many flowering species, this was actually in a wetland on the edge of Site C um, in, a, in one of the very few, um, in one of the very few button bushes that occur there. Um, and then crayfish, I'm not gonna say much about crayfish as um, based on our, we, we, with all our sampling, we found both the White River crayfish and the Canberra species C at all sites. Um, when we, we did do some digging at site E, we found a sickle crayfish. And actually on our first visit, just to scope out the site, Brina found a Carolina ladle crayfish, which, which is significantly rare on the restoration portion of site A, kind of downstream of our site. Now, quickly also, I just want to mention macrobenthic sampling that Larry Eaton performed. Um, he stated that all sites rated pretty good to fair, with the lowest site being number six, uh, with the lowest site, meaning on the, in the watershed, um, it was rating good, even though the site is heavily degraded. So site E is actually very surprising um, to all of us. Quick about um, water quality. Um, so primary results, these re, 
preliminary results for, are from DMS. They're both based solely on February to October 22 data. Stations three and four have the highest medium phosphorus concentration, slightly higher from storm samples. Um, it gets slightly higher for storm samples. SQ4 has roughly, roughly four to five times the concentration of phosphorus than samples collected upstream in the now deforested area. Um, S SQ4 station has a medium of 0.45 milligrams per, per liter for base flow samples for phosphorus, and the watershed for SQ4 has the highest pasture pressure for the proportion of overall land cover land use in the drainage. So according to DEQ, it's not that much different from ambient monitoring stream samples. And again, just to show you where SQ4 is, it's right here. You can see how degraded that habitat and that watershed is. Now, some of the results briefly about water quality that GSC um, analyzed, Greensboro Science Center, dissolved oxygen was overall good, pH range from 6.5 to 7.5 at all sites, which was decent. Conductivity was high um, compared to, you know, regular uh, water, you know, what you would find, you know, in just pure water. Um, it ranged from 75 to 85. However, Site D ranged from 140 to 160, and that's likely because Site D has very little buffer and there's active pasture, uh, hay pasture right there. So from um, the runoff from the from all the agriculture chemicals. Um, nitrates were typically below 1.2 parts per million threshold. The highest was at Site D again. Um, and Site E, where the cows spiked occasionally during the summer. And Site C had best averages for nitrates, which is good news for us. Chlorine was relatively low year round. Now, if you kind of compare the phosphate levels to what the DEQ sampled upstream in the upper watershed, it's around, um, in general, the water quality, um, uh, sorry, the Site C has similar levels to what was found. Um, in the headwaters. Site B, D, and E are pretty high in comparison to what they found. Um, and Site A, which is just downstream of DEQ sampling, um, which is right here, is, is not too terribly, but it's about the same as what they found, whereas Site C is a little bit lower. Um, but in general, water quality parameters she found, uh, GSC found were not in safe levels and they appear within range in most host animals. Now, I'm just going to quickly talk about um, the Kazi Farm mitigation site. Um, this is kind of switching gears. Here's our stinking quarter site. Um, this is a, we found out about this from Restoration Systems, which is the provider of stinking quarter. They brought, brought this up about this 18 year old mitigation project, um, which is within one mile of stinking quarter. And it's also along the North Prong stinking quarter and its, um, and its unnamed tributaries. So this is the unnamed tributary, here's a stinking quarter. So we said, oh, that's really interesting. It would be great to have a comparison of this 18 year old study site to stinking quarter. Um, so to tell you a little bit about the Kazi farm, it was established in 2004. Um, it's one of the oldest private mitigation sites in the States. It's about 60 acres or so, which is under the conservation easement. Um, during that time, all they did was restoration and preservation. Again, it was built by the same provider, which is Restoration Systems. And the conservation easement now is held by North Carolina Wildlife Habitat Foundation. So we went to North Carolina uh, quickly. Here is just kind of an overview of Causey Farm. Um, I'll come back to this here in a second. So we went, to, we went to the North Carolina Wildlife Habitat Foundation and asked for a grant to do a two year project that mirrors the stinking quarter study. So they provided us with $25,000 um, we've just begun collecting some data in late August, um, so we're still analyzing what we have already collected, so I don't have many results to say. However, I do want to say that we have two restoration sites and one preservation site. This is the preservation site. Um, very little understory of vegetation except for Japanese stilt grass. Um, it does have some canopy gaps, and where those canopy gaps are, there is some flowering vegetation. Um, and then we have site one, which is was restoration. It was along this uh, North Quarter, North Prong Stinking Quarter Creek, 
And actually a beaver dammed it up a long time ago. And it's actually a wetland complex of you know, scrub shrub and herbaceous um, vegetation. It provides a lot, this, this complex provides a lot of diversity and flowering species and whatnot, what not and whatnot. Um, and actually, anecdotally, we have found higher bee captures and butterfly detections and small mammal diversity or species richness at this site um, because I think of its, its complexity in habitat. Um, the preservation site, on the other hand, had few bees and butterflies detected at that site. Um, just to kind of go back to this picture, this is the whole wetland complex. Um, this is site one. Site two is also a restoration site, which has some um, ephemeral pond, ephemeral wetlands in it, um, but it's thin, you know, it's a 50 foot buffer or so on each side of the stream. And then you have site three here, which is our preservation site. Um, so that is all I have to say and um, apologize for the quickness of this, but I'll take any questions for whatever time there is left. All right, I'm not seeing any questions, just several folks saying great job. I'll reiterate that as well. Thanks, Olivia. I appreciate everybody. Appreciate everybody being here today. Hope uh, hope you have a great rest of your day and uh, hope hopefully we'll see you next time. All right. Thank you.